Welcome to a new episode of People and Tech. Today, an absolute treat. Um, voice on LinkedIn, a mind on LinkedIn, a curator on LinkedIn, someone who has single-handedly influenced the way that the world of work is seeing society, someone who has undoubtedly made contributions in that area that in the workforce can be pointed out every day, Karen Ferris. Karen is one of the most uh, well-known change and strategy consultants um, in Asia Pacific, I would say, and it's someone that I have immense respect for. Not only is Karen always clued in on the latest and most accurate statistics that show leaders how they should adapt their leadership towards resilience, towards flexibility, towards an agile mindset. But Karen has a deep comprehension and understanding of the entire helicopter view of the workplace today and the big questions that need to be answered. So if you have a chance, please pick up her latest book. Please subscribe to her newsletter on LinkedIn and follow her because there is little more erudite and intelligent, heartful curation that you can find. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope you come back next week because we have an immensely big treat for you. People who have also shaped the lives of those around them in the region, people who have written books, people who have changed the minds of entire generations of academia. Come back to People in Tech next week and thank you for listening to us. We hope you enjoy my heart to heart with Karen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of People and Tech. Just me today, Dave is away talking to clients, and he was very disappointed because our guest today is someone that he absolutely adores, reads regularly. She is someone who has shaped opinion in the world of work. She is someone who has changed organizations for the better, genuine influencer, and someone with so much curiosity and love for the people topic that you will be hard pressed to find someone else. So welcome to the show, Karen, and I will add a little little intro right before that and also leave people with a link to your LinkedIn because there's loads that they have to learn from you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been too long. It has. We've been we've been talking about this for many, many um uh, but we haven't quite gotten to it from any yeah. point of view. Yeah. You've written a book in life. Yes, so I've written another book. So um this will be my eighth book. Three, three of my books are tiny little wincy ones that are uh, business books, but I keep getting told, no, you should count them, count them. Um, so yeah, this one is called Be Remarkable, uh, Learn to Unlearn a New Leadership Mindset. And yeah, I'm very, very proud of this one. It's just, just I, I love it cover as well. I, I saw it earlier and it's absolutely lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah we had a bit of a debate about yeah, something that might just jump out and set people but yeah it's about the you know being a leader that's different and i think right. that's just we have a leadership crisis as far as i'm concerned right now we've had it for a while which just got worse Absolutely. We have had the leadership prizes, not only I read my book, but we have several chapters on leadership prizes, emotional intelligence crisis. We have a mental health crisis. We have so many, but this one, the leadership level, like Karen says, is, is that hopefully the one where we can make most change the fastest by just inspiring people. Is that what the book does? It will inspire leaders to say, you can be more courageous, and these are some things that could help you. Yeah, I mean, the, the expression, it was in my head felt for a while. And I think it was, you know, post-COVID, the realisation that we have many leaders, not all of them, uh, I use leaders loosely, but many leaders who just want to go back to how it was pre-2020. They're back into the office, sitting in wings on seats, and mountain control, micromanage, and they're like, Hold on, we've had a major shift. We've had the most successful experiment in the way we work ever. We should be embracing this as the biggest opportunity we've been presented mm. with. We didn't have to do anything. It did it for us. And um, we're suddenly getting this backlash. And I'm like, we've got leadership. We've been both pre-pandemic, but it's archaic. 
it's mm. just dinosaur like um and that's why one of the subtitles is learn to unlearn now i didn't come up with that phrase it was a guy called alvin toffler in his book future shock 1970 but it really was that like yes we learn it doesn't end there we have to be brave enough to say i need to unlearn what stood me stood me would say yesterday is no good today and that's tough because you're like, well, I've just spent 10 years developing my skills as a leader and now you're telling them they're irrelevant. And I'm like, yes, they are. Or 30 you years. To, or or, or, or more years. years. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Yeah. So uh, I think this is by having a growth, growth mindset. And I think we've got so many leaders with fixed mindsets. I think this is a really interesting one. And maybe, you know, when we, when we, when I address people from, from this podcast, I try to think of what I'm talking to. It's really different. You really have no control when you put something out there as to where it lands or not. But, but I have met, and you have met, hundreds of these people. Who I haven't met hilariously is I, I run another podcast called uh, Tales from the Fintech Tip. And we had access to the very top of the CEOs of everywhere. I still haven't met all the hundreds of thousands of execs and have made the hundreds of thousands of bonuses and then disappeared. I don't know who those people are. They're a very special breed that no one has really ever met. Maybe they keep to themselves. But the rest of us, one, yes, we all want to do good work. With that said, I would also like to hear the, but we are doing our best vein of thought that keeps happening because these two things have to be separated. We cannot say them in the same word, it will be bad for us as, a, as businesses. Then secondly, as you said, if we had this handed to us, these results, we didn't have to make these big checks. We didn't have to take a big decision. No one lost a job because they said, fine, you can work from home. It happened for you, big exact. Yeah. But what we have now, and I, I want you to, to, to remember, is leaders are accidental leaders. The vast majority of leaders we have are accidental leaders. The, there's a minority. They're non-accidental leaders. They are career leaders. They are possibly worse. <laughs> because, in a sense, these people have come from very regimented uh, business schools that told them that command and control is the only way. They even yeah. taught them very sick processes in which to micromanage. It's very yeah. difficult to make those people to learn anything. In fact, yeah. if you're a real CEO listening to this and you've noticed some of these people around, move them because in all honesty, find something else. Maybe they're a yeah. big uh, saxophone player or they can do yeah. APIs. Give them something else because yeah. the leader they're doing is probably not going to serve you. But everyone yeah. else does want to learn. As Karen says, and here's where we are, we have to unlearn. What's the first step to unlearn, though? Do they not need a whole lot of balls to unlearn first? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's got to be that wake-up call that to realise, and however that happens, whether that's feedback from other people, from the teams, from colleagues, whatever it might be, and this is the big kicker, it's that wake-up call to say, yeah, what I knew yesterday is, is not going to able, enable me to lead today. Um, and once that happens, then the rest just falls into place. It's okay. I need to relearn. I need to get rid of what I knew and relearn. So, you know, reaching out, finding what, you know, what, what new ways, special ways of leading, leading what employees are asking for, et cetera. But it's that recognition that I need to change. That's acceptance. Um, that's first place, right? That's, that's the case for anything we want to do in life. He does yeah. not stupid. They know that they, most leaders have fought with addiction. They fought with self discipline. They fought with very hard life, life moments. Let's face it, we've all been through very hard things. We know yeah. they have to work harder. These people bit. I don't, I don't even need to say it with more desperation. People know they have to relearn it. The resistance yeah. now and the denial now has to cease. Unfortunately, we've delegated as leaders this task to other people, and we hope Tiara or Soros will deal. The beauty of it is you can still delegate. The many of the things that yeah. Karen and I are talking about are going to depend on your team. It's so going to depend on each and every one of your people having the same moment, and you're going to have to raise them through it, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I think you know, the, the biggest example of the fact that leaders are stuck is that, you know, in 2020, and you've heard me quote these as before, when um, 
global surveillance software of employees went through the roof in March 2020. The global demand went up by 80% compared with the same time next year. So that's the same telling me we have, I'll call them bosses. Bosses are like, oh, I can't see them. I need to monitor their keyboard strokes because that will tell me that they've been productive. Everybody else knows that that's bullshit. It doesn't yeah, matter how hard you kick. And I say to these people, if they're, if they're not productive remotely, they weren't productive when you could see them. You just thought they were. And it, that mind, and then now we go, you know, oh, you need to be back in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense. And they're quoting productivity and they're quoting culture and they're quoting nothing that holds water. And it just, to me, it's just lots of stupidity. And everyone can see it. And it's, there's got to be some fallout at some point. I and mean, then we're always seeing employees uh, kicking back. Right. Um, right. And that's it, probably right. That could be it. That could be what's yeah. going to completely separate. Is it the new generation coming into the workplace? We will not yeah. stand for this. They will not stand for coming in. They will not stand for being disrespected. They will not stand for not being seen as different and needing adaptation. They will just not work for you. Not be small. I mean, if you are monitoring people, you are saying, I do not trust you. And who wants to work for an organization that says, I don't trust you? Come on in. I don't trust you. You know, um, I mean, you see the dig back at, you know, Dell, where employees have been threatened with, you know, paid cuts and no career progression or whatever. If they don't come back into the office, I'll take you to send a set. No, it's fine. <laughs> Stuff you, I'll take the pay cut. I'm not with my flexibility. Exactly. Like I like that there's there's all, almost I see a big search actually. I see people saying, Fine. Uh, you, you're okay to not point to understand who I am, but this is who I've believed I am now and I'm going to do that. And, and I think it's it's commendable because it is in a bad market. And we have to be honest that jobs are rare because people are holding on to them dearly and that's probably part of why we see no innovation and no intelligence coming into companies. Mm -hmm. But also so, so it's obviously a very scary thing to say, no, I, I need to be who I need to be. But the, the, the beauty of it, I think, is that we see it. We see it move. And, you know, it's, it's day to day. I have some podcasts when I'm so down in the that people are like, but come on, Brenna, you know it's going to change. You know it's already going to be 15, 20 years that we've been saying this. It's not only 15, 20 years to me, because I've run out of life to attempt to change this industry. But I know that in the grand scheme of things, it is a small moment. And I also say this a lot, but I think it's important to realize making technology was a small moment, I believe, oh. in, in the world development. We only had to make it by hand as humans for a yeah. while, a given five, 10 years. That's not going to be the norm. And for the ones that sit there and attempted desperately to make it work, we are collectively burnt out, we are yeah. tired, we are fed up, and we are very yeah. soon, unfortunately, going to be cast aside. So I think we're looking at several things in the workplace that I don't know that the HR professionals are as afraid of as we are on the other allies. Like mm -hmm. you say, everyone knows. Every HR professional is aware there is a crisis of leadership. There is yeah. a crisis of VQ. Nobody does any human work. We just pretend BAU works. I mean, everyone mm -hmm. is aware the emperor is butt naked, but no one is courageous enough internally to do much. They don't have the money to do much. There's a hope. There's a generalized hope. Maybe we can come back to set okay. point, which is insane, like you said. Mm -hmm. So... But, but also, like, so new generations coming in, existing, those of us that made digital completely burnt out and about to become mm. farmers because we've had enough. The value yeah. of ex technologists I find wanting to be a plower, that's their day job. That maybe one day they can direct their other people to, to doing something real and physical, you'd be surprised. But um, so, so all these things are happening, and obviously the pandemic and the worst thing that's happening that we don't talk about enough at what at all, and it just does not have it. The context, where do we live in? We live in a world that's disintegrating physically and, and emotionally and psychologically, right? So there's trauma all around us. There's, you know, there's, no matter how far you guys are slightly potentially feeling further away, but in the States, in Europe, there's a, a lot of conversation about where do we live so the atomic bombs don't hit us. So I'd like mm. us to remember that. Still, have, as parents and as humans, we still live in this 
say in political climate that hate our children, wants to bomb us, is attempting to... Yeah. And then we go to work and we pretend everything is fine from Wednesday to Thursday when they told us to show something on the screen. It is an insane convention. What can we do to break this? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? It's a big question. I think um keep saying to people they have to ask, and I'm not sure if this is answering the question, but keep asking why. Why am I doing this? Because I did it yesterday, no. Why am I doing this? What value is it adding? What purpose does it deliver? Because I think we do have all this going on in our in our lives. And you're right, we go into a sit in front of a screen and then we go, okay, it's all gone away now. <laughs> it's like, no, it hasn't, you know. But what am I doing? You know, what purpose is it serving? Um, and I think that's the biggest question that people just have stopped asking. Like, why? Why are we it, doing it? No. The thing I just because the question in purpose feels frivolous when people are in survival mode. Well, I think it's, yeah, because people want to, you know, go with lock, lock down and go into, you know, a, a safety, whatever that feels like, you know, and not ask the questions. Because it's like if I said to, for example, going back to the returns of the office mandate, if I said to the boss, why? And they said, it's our culture. I'm like, no, culture doesn't live in a building. So why? Oh, well, you'll be more productive. Well, sorry, research says I'll be more productive at home. So why? So you keep asking those questions. And I know if I did that, I'd probably be escorted out the door very oh, quickly. Well, that's the second <laughs> question anyway, because they know best. You know, so, you know, I keep saying to, saying to people they need to keep asking why, but they're like, whoa you know it's not it's going to rub the wrong way and we know it is so but unless we unless we do because i think the powers that be those buses unless we keep asking why they're not getting that wake-up call to go do you know what these people are actually right it's not about culture it's not about collaboration it's not about productivity if people want to go into an office it's because they want to because it's intentional they because it's the human children. connection it's the, because they want to connect, not because the boss said, because the boss would say, come in on a Wednesday, the connect, connectivity, and I could go in on Wednesday and be surrounded by hundreds of people and be most lonely and isolated ever. Like we all do on Wednesdays. Who hasn't had a hundred Wednesdays like that in an office? Yeah, so it doesn't just happen. You know it doesn't just happen. It has to be intentional. So it's about, you know, people need to, yeah, people need to call these bosses out yeah and keep a bit of question and hopefully but that takes courage i know it does but unless we do there's not going to have and some of them will make that you know some of them will probably just say you know culture connectedness productivity because they've been told to say that that's the line yeah just tell them that that's why we need them back in the office and when someone asks why and has that conversation not as an attack but just say come on really why why are, we, why are we going down this line? That the penny will drop. And that person goes, do you know what? You're right. Let's sit down and have a conversation about how we will work going forwards. And that's what I hope will happen. That my hopes, my hope, this is to create my day that this is ever going to ever going to happen, you know. I mean, there you are know, it will. It will happen. I just don't know if it's going to happen, but you know what <laughs> and we've got examples out there. I mean, and this, you know, a global company now, but Australian based Atlassian. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they've got this sorted. And well, I say that, they say they haven't. They're learning every day yeah. about how to work. And, it's, you know, they have a team anywhere. They have offices that nobody has to go into the office unless they want to. But there's a percentage of occupancy in their offices is quite high because people have chosen to. <laughs> So, and yeah, there are parameters around where people can work or whatever, but basically you can work anywhere you like, when you like, how you like. But so they had this opportunity to create freedom framework and they took it. Well, to be fair, Atlassian and many other companies, and I tell this, I say this sometimes, the companies that were 
born digital first. Yeah. The companies yeah. that were yeah. later to come in, they came in, to be fair, with smarter principles and the, the really yeah, smart absolutely. ones, we have gone to them and they didn't amass uh, yeah. human debt, of course, right? So we were talking the other week with people who are, you know, kind of, they have key organizations. They have un, uh, unstructured, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm yet still unclear how unhierarchical organizations really work. If I'm honest, because I <laughs> never worked in one myself. I get the theory, but I don't get how it works in practice. Probably doesn't, but that's just that's sorry for it while listening. I think what we see is that, and, and something you said that I want to catch up to it, personal responsibility. And we say this in all this truly where people don't like us as much. There are those consultants that always tell you that the bosses are piece of such and such and you should keep them. And those consultants go a lot better than we do. We don't do that. What we do, Karen and I, is go, no, you got to do some of this work yourself. I'm that serious. You got to start working on it. You got to figure out how to be not courageous. You got to figure out how to, you know, how to fold your wits and still elegantly explain how you feel and why that's important. You got to get involved humanly if you want them to come back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody liked that message because human work is hard. Yes. But the thing, the thing, the thing as, well, as well is that, you know, um, and this brings you said it to our Jake at Walburn a while ago in one of his books or for one of his books. And he said that most people get into a people leadership. There's lots of types of leaders. And I say everyone could be a leader. But, there's lot, but people leaders, people get into people leadership role in the late 20s, generally. The first development they get as a leader is in the late 30s, early 40s. So that means they've got nearly a decade where they don't get in the morning, up in the morning and go, I want to do a bad job. They want to be the best they can be, generally. There might be the exception, but generally people want to do the best they can. But with what? I've had no guidance, I've had no coaching. Have... The only role model I've got is the bad boss that went before me. So yes. you've got this perpetual cycle. You know, we, it's, you say that leaders need to be, you know, empathetic, empowering, give people autonomy, adaptive, all those sort of things. But we need to provide the help for leaders to do that. It's all right saying it and they can go, yeah, I probably do need to empower more. But oh, there's a lot of it. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> you know? bet. There are so, hundreds of conversations you and I have had where people go like, oh my God, that is absolutely true. And now what? Yes. And that now what is a good question. And a, a hopeful question, have I always seen it followed up by those leaders where they genuinely care and genuinely put anything in, in practice? No. And another thing is, we have to remember, leaders don't stay. The, the, what we were saying earlier is, the very dog we do not know, and we don't go to Davos, the CXOs that have what their uh, asset of like we have when we were CXOs, we know that. They have barely put their lives together and they're trying to find the next career move. So if your project and your uh, transformation happens to live with them and they are your only hero and the only person that has made, and I have seen hand on heart, uh, at least four people change a bank. Personally, themselves, each person changed uh -huh. their bank. I don't uh -huh. want to name, name it, but it's very possible. So if you have that agent, yeah. massive agent of change that you've been empowering yourself with your beautiful box and the uh -huh. resiliency work you've been doing, how do they spread it quickly to produce an army so that we can all help leadership go, no, nah, we're all humans, what the hell do we do together? <laughs> that is a really good question, and how do we? And I think we, I think we need to, I mean, yeah, part of it, part of it for me is, is writing a book and doing, you know, podcasts like this and this, all the stuff that I do on LinkedIn. And I think the challenges are so on set to me. Yeah, all the stuff you said is really good. But the, but the bad part isn't listening to what you're saying. You know, but people listening to what you're saying are all going, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. The person who really needs to hear you is probably not listening. So they're hearing you listening. though, Karen. They are hearing you. So eventually yeah. they listen. Yeah, and I think it's just keep chipping away at it, and I think doing it through various mediums at every level of organisations. So you know, talking to people on the front line, talking to you know middle managers, talking to just hopefully that the conversation will eventually get some sort of momentum. The sewer goes, that's what's next. Right, right. Let's grab that. Let's do something. And 
the key message I keep trying to say to people as well, start small. Exactly. I've literally been to say, like, you know, 20 things, 20 traits a leader should have today. Like, I'm not expecting you to go, I got us 20 a lot. Pick one. And I love that, that you said start small because I think this is what really terrifies people, right? When, do do you and I and everyone else say there is a way in which you could all go home, come back in and make a better world? Yes. Are we telling you you should do that? No, because we know you cannot. You are not equipped and the world is not equipped to do that. So what we're telling you to do is chip away. And the chipping away has never been just theoretical. You know, there are those academics out there that just want to talk about the topic. I don't, you don't. I know people that don't. We just want to do yeah. things, make them better. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's, there's to-dos, there's softwares, there's workbooks, there's, there are resources endless if you just yes. genuinely want to do things. And like Karen says, pick one thing as a trait. Then in this one and in many other books, there are 20 ways in which you can query your culture today. They're not mine. They're from uh, Spotify, Ron Westroom, Baby Edmondson, yourself and everyone else. And just do these 20 things, figure out what you're doing. Okay. Well, we, we have given you all the things that we would be selling you and you don't want to buy it. For right. free already, just do the things. <laughs> it's like I've been on from workshops with leaders and that I spoke about empowering staff. Uh, moving can be micromanagers, and they know they are. They're happy to actually say it. They go sort of, mm, I know. But they see this move to empowering people to a big jump. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let's start small. Pick one task that's really low risk. So you're not going to, if it goes wrong, it'll be all right. And pick a member of staff that you can say, Mary, I know I need to change my leadership style and this is what I'm going to do and I'd like to work with you and get your feedback and blah, 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 blah. And give Mary a small task to do, empower her to give the clear goals, deadlines, reporting, basically whatever it might be, and get out of the way. And they talk about it and they go, that was awesome. Did that work? But you know, because they don't, yeah, that worked. Um, it didn't backfire. Mary's really inspired. He's reaching out for the next thing. I had more time on my hands. No. So then the next thing is that bigger. And it's all about comfort zone, isn't it? Each time you step outside your comfort zone, the comfort zone gets bigger. Right. You keep expanding it. Until it how to, this is amazing. Just that minor thing that you're teaching them in, in that is, is a combination between learning how to delegate, creating a human connection, and being yeah. humble and vulnerable at the same time. So that's an incredibly powerful act you could do tomorrow in any of your one on ones. Where are the yeah. one on ones, though, Karen? Sorry? Where are these one on ones where they should talk to Mary, though? But let's face it, we knew when we started all this, all people need to do is genuinely open-heartedly talk to each other. Yeah. And yeah. It's, be it's become harder and harder in the workplace. And that's the yeah, main it's about, yep. you know, I think one of the biggest things leaders are there, and this is, you know, history. Could you get put in a leader, leader position and somewhere there's this unwritten rule that says you now need to know everything. I've never seen it written down, but there's people who believe it. And they go, I can't say I don't know. Oh. You know the, the bright leaders are the ones that say, I don't have the answer to that. What do you think? You know, you're my subject matter expert. What do you think? How do you think we should do this? And to, to you and me, that's just common sense and conversation. But for a lot of leaders, that's like, that's showing I'm yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. 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 I'm seeing as vulnerable. And... You know, Randy Brown said, vulnerability is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of courage. It's absolutely... And she said this 15 years ago. I was going to point <laughs> this out. I was literally going to say this, that Brandy Brown has been trying these people on Netflix, not like you and I, on LinkedIn <laughs> in a corner. And she is <laughs> eloquent and she's lovely and they adore her. And she has New York Times bestsellers. Have you seen anyone do anything about it much other than say, I will be vulnerable? Once, as a leader, I was scared of a donkey. Now you guys continue having psychological safety. Goodbye. Uh, so, uh, yeah. We will laugh because otherwise we'd cry, right? Yeah, I think so. But I think it comes down to that. And we have to be, we have to be resilient as well in terms of 
just chipping away and chipping away. And it's like they say, you know, we could go well running around with Netflix and documentaries and bestsellers. We've been saying this for 15 years. Well, it's changed. <laughs> it's just, you know, I've been... <laughs> made books. Nothing's really changed, you know. We have to keep that belief. So yeah, things try. can get better. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to. I find myself sometimes, you know, it's it's this them versus us, people who are still employed versus people who are on the outside trying to talk at them. And we all think the grass is greener on the other side. And let me tell you, it is a lot greener on the other side in some ways. In some ways, it is hot. <laughs> you don't want to be there. But um, either way, look, when, we were, when I was back in my former life, I made software for financial technology. When you do, you talk to these incredibly terrified bank executives yeah. who have managed to stretch their lives, and I know how it happens, to the point that if they don't bank 100,000 a month home, they die. It happens. It, it happens very easily. If it come and actually jokes aside for anyone who doesn't know, please take the work of uh, of uh, Yale on this and take take the work of the Virgin um, Virginia institutions on this. People get very easily used to whatever amount of money they bring in and they, they leave as long as they have the thing. So yeah. it is very possible that exams are under humongous home pressure and, and also let us also be honest there's something with the identity area there's intersectionality there's not only the pressure of being in money there's also the fact that i know we think white mayors is who we like to hate these days and we do but not all mm. of them are affordable and i'm a, a, a great majority of them have gone through horrible trauma and they are mm. going through life attempting to generate economy while being suicidal i think that's a massive thing we need to start looking at sometime mm. yesterday because not nice to have that happening to put it by it's like we have a new slavery layer i say this <laughs> but um but still, if we have all this and the answers are we can't do big day walks. We're not capable. Let's face it. I'm meeting the first 15 years ago that said, no, you could have people come in like they should and have perfect peace. And they were like, that's funny. <laughs> so we're not doing that. We're, 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 and we're not doing big transformation projects. That's something I wanted to say and to ask you. What I see in Europe and what I see in, uh, in England, we made it different in America, is there are zero big transformational projects still happening. We're done. Yeah. We're good. We're performed. We don't need data. We don't need DNA. We don't need anything. We're good. But even if you don't do one of these big things, the, the popcorn experiments that check how people working together can increase their, their collection. The popcorn experiments where you as a human being listen to Brennan Brown again and try to find it. Those things cost nothing. They're only a credit owner from you. And we know yeah. we're talking to people who have read us for, for 15 years since we said don't buy IBM. Please keep the, the, if you're still in, keep the, keep the faith. And many of you who are listening to this are not still in. You're out and you're probably burnt out and fed up and don't want to even listen to this stuff again because we're already doing something yeah. and nothing changes. But there is change. I feel like yeah, the new so... generation will, will pull us, what do you think, <laughs> by the ears. What do you think happens yeah. when they come in? Absolutely. I think, and I think it's refreshing because I think that there's going to be, um, I think there's going to be a big pushback. I think, you know, the, the generations that are coming now and, and employees in general, but coming in and saying, you know, I want work-life balance. I want, yes, of course, salary and benefits is a given. Always will be, has to be, because we all want standard of living. But tax stability, work-life balance, um, environment of trust, uh, a good culture, career development, a progression. I want to see, before I start, I want to see where I could go. These are all the things this generation I mean, are looking for. And it is isn't to what we look for, or I look for when we started a job. It's all very security. And they're like, yeah, so I'll just go for another job, you know, gig economy, whatever. I want to work from wherever I can work. Mm -hmm. um, that's the nature of the job. So there's a very different expectation. And I've written about this recently, about the gap between what employers generally think new and, and talent want and what talent wants. And there's a massive gap. And it's like, why is there a gap? Because you're not talking to people. It's like, you know, if you're doing a recruit, if you're trying to recruit talent, surely you go and find out what they want 
So if your organization can deliver on that, to me, it's 101 stuff, but they don't. They just assume that there's a big assumption that we, we know best. So I think there is going to be pushback. I think we just have to watch it happen and, and, and I'd like to help it happen as well. Um, to make that turnaround, and maybe it's that pushback is going to be that catalyst that makes these the leaders that need to change go. Mm. The wake up call. It's time. It's time. Yeah. It's time. Or get out. Because I, mean, I just feel like it's much earlier that they get out. When I was young, yes. we, which was very, very long ago, it feels like, but maybe not 15, 20 years ago, when we got into banking, the, the word was. <sighs> They're going to have this spaghetti, horrible thing for another 10 max, because this guy's got to get out. I mean, this is not going to be forever. This world is out on it anyways, and they're not going to do anything until they disappear. But those people were 70, Karen. They were not our age trying to change the world and be done. Um, they were just hanging on to seats. I don't think those people are there anymore. I think we have a new generation of people hanging on to seats out of sheer fear and paralyzation of what, what in the hell do I do with this much human debt? I have entered here and tried to do my best, but what I'm looking at is a massive cultural fuck-up, and I don't know where to start. And I think that's what's burning people. I think there's also, like I said, the intersectionality to existing context Life drama, existing life drama that's not discussed. And that's my heading. We've just recently went through some horrible episodes, and I've realized that many in particular are absolutely disallowed from ever showing the weakness of him. Sad and desperate. I am, I make all kinds of things because things are happening to me. And equally, the proportion of men who live with this, with, with broken families, not being able to see their children or in, in dire Ooh. need, is humongous, in particular in our, yeah. uh, in yeah. our, uh, in yeah. our yeah. segment. So I think there's just so much need to do fast. The new generation can do it for us, but we're not done. We cannot leave them with this. We have to leave them to fight with better. Yeah, yeah. And I think we, you know, we've already said this, the help is out there. The resources are there, the people to to reach out to, to say, you know, how can I do this better? How can I make a difference? How can I make a change? It's all there. It always has been. It's about having the courage to say, I need help. Or, How much does yeah. it cost, though? Again, let's be honest. If you and I are yeah, a mid-sized no enterprise and someone says you need a cultural transformation, we'll be like, first of all, F off, do not. We are great. We are amazing. They talk to us, they ask us why 50 times, and they go like, maybe they're right. Um, let's do it. What do we need to do? The impression would be, do we need 500,000 and to stick everyone down and to tell them command and control now we're going to change and do human work? Obviously, you know. That is not what you're going to do. That is not a thing. Don't don't buy those decks and those beautiful presentations. Someone was telling me yesterday that when they lost the contact to one Stanley or someone or other, it's a general big name. The um the the the, the buyer asked them, but you know what? I, I didn't buy the real guys, but I don't want slides. And the answer was, I don't want PowerPoint slides. And the answer was, well, we have crazy as well. No, oh, I'm sending you in a PDF. <laughs> That's where we're at, right? So it's history and our, our public barriers. But it happens to all of us. Like yes, genuinely, yes. We, we have created an industry where the biggest agencies are the only one trusted and they're also the stupidest sometimes. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. Um, it's, it's hard. I think you know, one of the challenges as, as an independent consultant, and I've talked to other people who found the same, especially quote COVID, is that there's a lot of, you know, this diversity around and, you know, if I'm going to an organization say, right, you know, here I can I can help you with, you know, some leadership capability uplift and they're gonna go, no. I'm gonna go to one of the big names, I don't have to name any of them. That kind why? of maybe I guess who knows. <laughs> and the reason why is because if it all goes pear shaped, that person could say, Yeah, but it was it wouldn't be. It would be Deloitte. Yeah. Where her? You know, because you do keep no, you name them. Uh, not picking on any of them. But they could say, well, it wasn't my fault. Is because that the same nobody gets fired for buying IBM? It's Whereas, that same you know, one. Through, through the Karen Ferris, you know. So I think that's uh, that's another thing, I think. Always go with the big boys because we've felt, I will feel safer. Yeah, and and showing yeah. results is not as I remember being the small software company who was in the same situation. We were competing against the really big software companies, and we were saying, "Oh, but the thing yeah. we made is better and whatever." But the the, the the real back then, you could at least say, "Look, look, 
look at the broom, look at that see, see more money, more stuff. These days you can show proof of more money, more engagement, better lives to almost whoever yeah. you like with very little result, which is scary to me. Like I say, yeah. a crisis of courage everywhere. And they suggest, I don't know what, because I don't have it most days either. And I'm sure all of us wake up going like, as her courage and her bravery and change, let's just make it through. And those days, that's fine. But the days that you have any courage, let us know. We have like literally hundreds of just here, three pages of things you could do for your life to be better. Yes. See my work. Give them a shot. Read, please, what Karen said. Please subscribe to her amazing newsletter on LinkedIn. Yeah. You learn so much. The way I found Karen, that's an, a, a good story to tell everyone, is because I think Karen is one of the remaining few genuine intelligent curators out there. I don't know if she manages to read as much as she used to. But back no. in the day, anything that needed to be known, you could get it out of Karen. So please read and buy her book and reach out because she can help you make that change. Thank you so much yeah. for coming over, Karen, and hopefully we'll have you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.